We're wrapping up the book of Proverbs tonight in Proverbs chapter number 31, famously known uh, for the, the passage that's starting in verse number 10 all the way to the end about the virtuous woman. And this is, this is definitely different. You notice there's, there's a lot of similarities between the Proverbs. We've gotten through all the way up to this point. Last week and this week are slightly different. Um, these aren't the Proverbs of Solomon. Last week it was the, the words of Agur, the son of Jakey. And then this week we're starting off in verse number one, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Now last week I, I brought up a point on that word prophecy. And it probably wasn't the best time. I probably should have waited till this week because as we got into the study, there were some, um, some things mentioned that are definitely applicable for future events. But the point I was making last week is that the word prophecy doesn't always necessarily have to refer to things that have not happened yet. It does not have to automatically be talking about a future event. We typically use the word prophecy as something that's referring to something that's going to happen in the future. Bible prophecy, what are we talking about? We're talking about the return of Jesus Christ. We're talking about all these other things, right? Uh, I want you just to turn real quick to the book of Amos. Amos chapter 3. So if you go forward in your Bibles, past all the, the big books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and you get into the minor prophets, we're going to Amos chapter number 3. So this week, and like I mentioned last week, you know, in Proverbs chapter 30, there were definitely a few places where you could say, this is talking about future events. Okay, that's fine. And, 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 and I was preaching and teaching that there were some, you know, there's a generation that, you know, curses their father and does not bless their mother, right? Or the other way around. And um, there is a generation coming forward. But what we see in Proverbs 31, and we read this whole thing, it's some wisdom for a king. Just some warnings and some advice on what to stay away from. And then it turns into finding a virtuous woman and all the attributes that go along with a virtuous woman. There is nothing prophetic in the sense of future events being explained here in Proverbs 31. And what I want you to see in Amos chapter 3, verse number 8, the Bible reads, The lion hath roared. Who will not fear? So, right, it's a common thing for people to fear when the lion roars. You, you hear a big roar of the lion and you're out in the jungle, you're out in the wilderness, right? And you hear a lion. Yeah, it's a fearful thing, right? Where is that thing? And then he follows it up with, The Lord God hath spoken. Who can but prophesy? Prophesying is what you do when you're preaching God's word. Now, oftentimes when you see prophecy or prophesying in the Bible, it's naturally talking about future events because all throughout the Old Testament, when God was speaking to his prophets, he was speaking about things that were going to happen, right? I mean, we, we saw the prophecies of Isaiah, of Jeremiah, of Ezekiel. Where, where, where Israel's going to be judged, and he's giving these prophecies of all of these things that are about to happen shortly in the future because God said so. So when, But any time... People are preaching, thus saith the Lord. They're prophesying. Why? Because they're speaking the words that God has spoken. That's why the Bible says, the Lord God hath spoken who can but prophesy. When you receive the word of God from God and you speak those words, you're prophesying. You're preaching. And that's, and that's I just want to point that out because here, turn, turn back if you would to Proverbs 31. And I wanted to give you one more reference for that. Uh, just to show you kind of the meaning of that word. When you go through and you study and you look up prophecies and prophesying and stuff, the majority of the time it is going to be referring to future events. It really is. So I'm not, you know, but, but not in every single case. Really what the word is talking about, though, is, is preaching whatever it is that God has to say. So if you're reading in the book of Revelation, we're talking about future events. If you're reading in other books, we're, we're, we'd be prophesying about events that have already happened. But if it's the words that God hath spoken and we're speaking those, then that's what prophesying is. So let's get into this now. We see these are the words of King Lemuel. And this is interesting too. It's the words of King Lemuel, right? But it's the prophecy that his mother taught him. So in a way you could say, well, these are also his mother's words. But we find that these words are scripture. So ultimately, 
Whose words are they? They're God's words. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Verse number two. What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Now, he was a king, King Lemuel. He's being raised to be a king by his mother. And this is some of the advice that his mother is giving him throughout this chapter. In chapter 31. And again, I just want to reiterate, it's important to note that these are the words of God. This is not just the opinion of King Lemuel's mother. If it were just her opinion, then it wouldn't be written down as scripture for us to study and learn week after week as we're studying the word of God. And it's important to note that because the very first thing that she says in verse number three, give not thy strength unto women. This is biblical and scriptural advice for King Lemuel not to give his strength unto women. God has created men and women differently. We need to recognize this as being scripture. God has created men to be in charge, to be the leaders, to be the rulers, inside and outside of the church, and inside of the home. In all these situations, and all these scenarios, the way that God has created men is that he has given them the authority to be the ones leading, to be the ones in charge, to be the ones that have the strength. Now, turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to get into so th this sermon tonight, because we're talking about the virtuous woman overall, we're going to deal with a lot about just women and what their role is and what the Bible says about women and how they should be acting and, and just their overall place in society according to Scripture, according to what the Bible says. And there is nothing, I don't think there's anything wrong about this. I praise God for His Scripture and for the place that He's given unto women as well as for His place that He's given unto men. I'm glad that He made us different. I don't want to be married to a man. I think I mentioned this already once before. You know, if I wanted my wife to be real manly, I mean, I'd be worried that I'm a fag or something because <laughs> I don't want her to be manly. I want her to be feminine. I want her to be godly and virtuous, and we're going to get into all that when we get through Proverbs 31. But we're starting right off the bat with something that in 2016, our culture, our society is going to find offensive. What do you mean, give not your strength unto women? What's wrong with women? Why can't women be a judge? What do you mean, women can't be strong too? Come on, what, what are you talking about? Why are you reading that old book? Well, if you don't like that, buckle your seatbelts because you're in for a long ride. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. So what is this talking about? Modest apparel. Modest means you're not drawing a lot of attention to yourself. You're not giving anybody a reason to look upon you, whether it be because you're wearing a low-cut top or skin-tight clothing or because you have a bunch of jewels and you've just got all these sparkles and everything to make people look at you. All of those things are immodest when, you, when you're drawing an attention to yourself. So he's saying here, women should adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Sobriety is seriousness, right? Not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. And that's more, you know, again, just going on with the definition of being dressed modestly. Verse 10, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. This is showing an emphasis not on your outward appearance, not on the things that you wear, not worried about getting all glittered up and, and wearing things so everyone could look at you, not worrying about those things at all, wearing what's functional, wearing something that's modest and discreet, and doing good things, doing good works, as that is what you're putting on. That is what you're wearing. When people look at you, what are they seeing? Are they seeing a, a person, a woman that's putting herself up on display? Possibly as if you're for sale? Or are you looking at a woman who is letting the world just see her good works and her love for God and doing the things that the Bible says a virtuous woman would do? Let's keep reading here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 11. 
Bible reads, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach. Look at this next phrase. Nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So this isn't just talking about between husbands and wives. We know that the husband is the head of the household, and we're going to get into that when we go to Ephesians chapter 5. This is a different scenario. This is talking just about women being teachers nor usurping authority over the man, which lines up with what we just read in Proverbs 31, give not thy strength unto women. They shouldn't be ruling over you. They shouldn't be in charge over you because there is a certain authority that God has given to man that women shouldn't be usurping that authority over the man. It says, but to be in silence. And then it goes on to explain, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, did they both sin? Yes, they did. But there's a difference in the way that they sinned. And it, you know, he's explaining this goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Okay? But I still think there's a fundamental difference between a man and a woman. And this is why God has made men to be rulers and in charge. is because Adam made a bad choice as far as his sin and, and doing that which was not lawful, something that God told him not to do. But he wasn't deceived about it. He knew full well what he was doing. So the woman was the one that was deceived and tricked by Satan into eating of that forbidden fruit. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3 real quick. Since, since 1 Timothy chapter 2 brings it up, we're going to go and look now at what happens here in, in Genesis chapter 3. But a godly woman is not going to try to usurp, usurp authority over the man, is not going to try to rule over the man, is not going to try to be the teacher, but they're going to be the ones that are in silence and listening and being subject, in subjection. Verse number 16, unto the woman he said, in Genesis 3, 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And look at this. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. God has ordained this. This goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. This is after they're all caught in their sin. And God's you know, handing out the sentences against the serpent, against Adam, and against Eve. And the judgment that came against Eve is that, one, in sorrow she could bring forth children. That the, the whole labor process is going to be way more difficult now than whatever it was before. Don't know what his plan was before, but now it's, this is, you're going to be uh, bringing forth children with sorrow. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. He made it so that her desire was going to be to her husband. And he's going to be the ruler. He's going to be the head of the household. And today we have, we have people, look, this is scripture. This is Bible tonight. Do you believe the Bible or not? I think you're here tonight because you believe the Bible. We don't sugarcoat things. We just say, this is, thus saith the Lord, we prophesy the Bible. We're not going to be like the false prophets of Jeremiah's age. just says, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 5. In the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start reading in verse number 22. In Ephesians chapter 5, there's great advice for husbands as well as wives, but tonight we're just focused on women, we're focused on wives, we're focused on a godly role for women. Verse number 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Now, as we continue to go through these passages, it should be increasingly difficult to try to just explain away what these verses are actually saying. Because I know a lot of people want to try to do that. The false prophets of today are going to try to explain away what these verses actually mean. But when you read them in context, you read what they're saying, 
You cannot get past the fact that a wife is supposed to be submissive to her husband. That the husband is the head of the household. It means he's the one that's in charge. He's the one that makes the decisions. And that the, the wife should be an obedient role to her husband. This is scripture. And it even goes as far as to say that even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the Savior of the body, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, as much as you expect this church to follow Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only and every single thing that he has said for us to do, that's the way that we ought to be doing it. As closely, as intently, as diligently as we ought to be doing that in this church, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. It's what it says. I'm not making this stuff up because it just somehow benefits me to, because I'm a man. And look, I've, I've mentioned this before. I'll mention it again. Being a leader, being the one in charge, isn't necessarily always what it's cracked up to be. You know, women want to be in charge of everything else. It's not an easy job being the one that's responsible because at the end of the day, you know who's responsible for my family? I am. You know what happens when the sin happens and, and my kids get into trouble? You know who's responsible? Ultimately, I am. You know what happens when, when you know, people get hungry, when people get hurt, when we need to take care of them, medically, health, whatever the case may be? I'm responsible at the end of the day. I have to be making all the right decisions on, on what comes into our house, what type of influences we have. Everything boils down to me. And look, it, it, as it were, the blood is on my hands, right, for, for my entire family. Right. So there is a big responsibility there. It's not just, uh, you know, oh, you guys are just on some power trip or something. Now, look, if there's a guy on a power trip, I'm not saying that's right. You know, you shouldn't be some fascist dictator in your house that's just like doesn't care about your family and all you care about is yourself and just having a bunch of slaves. Okay, and that's not what the Bible's prescribing as the right way for husbands either. You know, husbands are supposed to love their wives and be willing to give yourself for them. And, but we're not going to get into the husbands tonight. I just want to, you know, I'll just briefly mention that because, there, you know, God's plan is perfect. God made us the way that we are. God made man, God made woman, and he knows the role that they ought to be in. And if you want to be happy in your marriage, if you want to be happy in your life, you ought to try to seek out God's will and his role that he has designated for you to walk in. That you're going to have the most joy that way. Walking in the, way, the path that God has for you is going to give you the most joy in your life. Amen. And for women, for wives, we're, as we're reading these passages, we're looking at that very clearly tonight. And in 2016, it could be a very hard pill to swallow because that's not how you were raised. That's not what the world's teaching you. That's not what everyone else is saying all around you. You're going to get made fun of for leanness. You're going to think that people are going to think you're in a cult. People are going to think that you're crazy. People are going to think that you're weird. You should go back to 1950, whatever. You're going to hear all kinds of different things. You're going to have the attacks against you. But ask yourself this question, do I believe God's word or not? Is it still applicable today or is it just some cultural thing that we don't need to worry about today? We believe in God's words being pure. They're undefiled. They are timeless. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Culture doesn't dictate what's right and wrong. That's right. God does. That's right. Turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 3. And I didn't put this in my notes, but I, I, I want to mention it right now before I forget. You're turning to 1 Peter chapter 3, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, there's also this reference for women in the church, okay? I'm going to start reading for you in verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. So again, it lines up exactly with the passage we already saw in first, excuse me, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. But then it goes on. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge 
that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. I don't think it's a coincidence that right after he gets done speaking about women in the church and women need to keep silence and that women need to learn in silence and if they want to learn anything, ask your husband at home. Following that up directly with, oh, you think you're spiritual? You think you're a prophet? You think you know God's word? Well, then let him acknowledge. If you think you're that way, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. These are God. This isn't just Paul being a misogynist, right? I heard this out so long a couple weeks ago. I don't really like, you know, you spend so much time reading about in the epistles of Paul. Uh, no, it's called God's word. It's called scripture. You think you're spiritual? You think you're a prophet? You think you know the Bible? You better acknowledge this, that what Paul wrote here is God's word. They're the commandments of the Lord. It's not just him making this stuff up. You're in 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. We're going to see some more advice for the wives. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own... Do we, hear, do we sense a theme here at all? I mean, is there uncertainty in what the Bible is teaching here? 1 Peter 3, 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. This is really interesting point here because this is, this is getting rid of all excuses as to why you don't have to be in subjection, why you don't have to be doing what God told you to do. Because you might want to say, well, my husband, he's not even saved. Well, my husband, you know, he's not a godly leader. My husband isn't doing what he's supposed to be doing, so I'm not going to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. The Bible is saying here, no. Actually, it's the other way around. If you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, that'll make much more of an impact on your husband then. Because what happens is it turns into this vicious cycle where... The husband say, well, my wife's not being very godly, so I'm not going to be a very good leader. I'm not going to love her the way I should. And then the, the wife's saying, well, he's not doing what he's supposed to. He doesn't love me enough, so I'm not going to be serving him and be in subjection to him. So there. And it just keeps going back and forth and back and forth, and the marriage stinks. And no one's happy. But if just one of them can break that cycle by just saying, I'm just going to do what's right. I'm going to do what God asked for me to do, regardless of them. Because here, think about this. Is there any other circumstance that you could think of where doing what God has told you to do, you just don't have to do it because someone else isn't doing their thing? I mean, there's so many sinners in this world that, that can do you wrong. Does that all of a sudden just mean, well, now I don't have to do what's right anymore because of what someone else is doing? Of course not. That's ridiculous. We need to worry about ourselves. That's who you have control over. And you know, look, I understand there are people that are not in very good marriages as far as somebody mistreating the other person or whatever. Okay, and I'm, and I'm not saying it's okay for, for whoever's in the wrong to be acting the way they're acting or, or doing what they're doing. But you can't make them be forced into the way you want them to be or the way God wants them to be. But what you can do is be an example of what God said you should be. This is what you need to do. And he says, it goes as far in 1 Peter 3, he says that if any obey not the word, this is in verse number 1, if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, a conversation, that word in, in, in the King James Bible is not just referring to the things that you speak. Conversation goes more broadly into the way that you act and the things that you do. That's what the word conversation is referring to in the King James Bible. So it's not even just the, the things that you're talking about, but it's everything that you do. It encompasses your lifestyle. If any obey not the word, they also may be without the word won by the conversation. So the things that you're doing can win your husband over because you're doing what's right, because you're being an obedient wife, because they could, you know, and it might take a long time. I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight, but they can see these things over and over and over and over again in you, and something might click with them and just be like, I need to get right now. Maybe they'll start to feel guilty because their wife is so spiritual and they're so ungodly. 
It says in verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Verse 3, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. Again, talking about the outward appearance. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. God has a high value on the woman that has a meek and a quiet spirit. We've already seen through the book of Proverbs that a loud and a stubborn, obnoxious woman is not anything that any man wants to be around. Okay, and it's not a godly quality. It's not something that's good to just be this loud mouth and just telling everyone the way it is and, and being in charge. It's, it's acting like you're a boss, being bossy, right? And there's another word that this world doesn't like using about women, but nobody likes bossy women and the Bible condemns it. But God puts a high value on having a meek, which would be humble and quiet spirit. Being in subjection, being willing to, to do the, the service that you are called to do if you're married within your marriage. Okay? If you're not married, men, this is, these are a lot of great attributes. You say, well, I'm not a woman, I'm not a wife. Well, you're not married, this is what you should be looking for in a wife. We're looking for the virtuous woman. Again, we're going to get into that a lot more in detail in, in Proverbs 31. But all of this, I want to show you the consistency of this. And especially for the women, this is what God has for you to do. Look at verse number 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Talking about your adorning. And again, it has nothing to do with your physical appearance. He's saying the, men, you know, the women of old time, they adorned themselves with their good works by being in subjection to their own husbands. Look at verse number six. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. And again, we see there that the Bible is, is explaining that the, the, the wife is the weaker vessel. God made women, and, and this should not be very difficult to comprehend, that men are stronger than women. I mean, physically and even emotionally. I mean, men should be the, you know, solid and there and, and, and uh, dependable, faithful for the woman to be able to rely on in a marriage and um, recognize that. And, and that's why, you know, the man has God-given strength. Don't give your strength unto women. To King, let's go back to Proverbs 31. We're going to spend the rest of the portion tonight now in Proverbs 31. We're not going to turn anywhere else. But I just want you to see the clear teaching and the consistent clear teaching throughout the Bible. There's many places that bring this up, and we didn't even turn to all of them. Proverbs 31, look at verse... Uh, verse number four, because this is still, the, we're starting off with the wisdom for the king, for King Lemuel. Hey, if you want to do something great, you want to be a king and you want to lead right and do what's right, this is what you need to listen to. We start off, don't give your strength unto women. It is not for kings, verse four, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink, and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Now, this is not an endorsement by any means to drink alcohol. This is not, because a lot of people like to turn and see, well, I've got a lot of problems, so it's okay for me to drink alcohol. You're completely missing the spirit in the way that this is being spoken to King Lemuel. What she's saying is that you, Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine at all. You shouldn't be touching this stuff. Why? Because you're better than that. You know who the alcohol is for? It's for the derelict. It's for the drunk. It's for, it's for these people that, that aren't going anywhere. They're not doing anything. You know what? Let those people drink. Let those people destroy their lives. Just whatever. Let, it, let them do their thing. Let them, let them wallow in their misery. But that's not for you, my son. And that's the way I teach my children. You're going to see drunkards out there. You're going to see people going out and partying up. You know what? Let them have their miserable lives. But that's not for you. 
And I'm not going to get into the whole drinking wine thing. We've done that already in previous chapters. But, um, you know, this is, again, it's, it, it explains. Look, when you drink, you can forget, you're going to forget the law. You're going to forget God's law. You're going to forget about what God said and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. And it's not, definitely not for kings to be in that position. But let's keep going here. Verse number 8. Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Again, just some more things that he needs to be thinking about and be responsible for that um, you need to be righteous in your judgment. And again, we've gone over that earlier in the book of Proverbs. I want to focus still more now on verse number 10 through the rest of the chapter. We're going to see the attributes of a virtuous woman. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Now, it's a ruby is a, a precious stone, right? Why is it precious? Because they're rare. There's rarity to them. They look nice, and they're, they're, they have a hold of high value in people's eyes, right? You could trade them. You could sell them and get a lot of money for them. But a virtuous woman, her price is far above ruby, rubies. Virtuous woman is someone who, what's virtue? Someone who wants to do good, who wants to do righteously, living godly. Finding a virtuous woman is not easy. This is not just every woman you come across is going to be a virtuous woman. They're rare. They're harder to find, which, you know, and their price is, is far above rubies. You found something great when you found a virtuous woman. And praise God for that. Verse 11. Now we're going to get into the attributes of a virtuous woman. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. She's someone that's faithful, someone that's dependable, someone that her husband doesn't have to worry about at all. Going out, getting into trouble, getting into gossip, being idle, talking to other guys, doing whatever. The heart of her husband can safely trust in her. When she goes out, when she comes, you know, all the business she's doing, I could trust her and not have to worry about it at all. And, and there's a comfort in that for the husband, definitely, to being able to just safely trust him. I mean, I thank God for that. I completely trust my wife, and, 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 and I feel completely secure and safe in all that she does. That she's not just going to go making some really stupid decisions and, you know, doing all, you know, just causing all kinds of problems for our lives, you know, making a bunch of unwise choices. But when you have a virtuous woman, the husband can safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. And there's no reason for him to go out looking for anything else from another woman or from anyone else, from any other place for that matter, because he's completely relying and, and trusting in his wife at home. Look at verse number 12. And this ties in, again, with everything else that we've already seen. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. When you're married to a virtuous woman, she's going to do him good. And honestly, the, the, the wife was created, Eve was created, to be a help meet for Adam. If you remember, when Adam was there, and God says, not good for the man to be alone, I will make an help meet for him. He needs a helper. He needs somebody else, a companion. And he made all the animals, you know, all the beasts, you know, we got, he even made a dog, you know, man's best friend, but none of them were suitable as the help meet for Adam. They, didn't, they weren't enough to be complete for, for the man, to not be alone. And that's when he created a woman. And we saw then that her desire is to beat her husband. And we see here that a virtuous woman is going to do her husband good. You're going to be focused on it. You're going to be thinking about your husband. What can I do for him? How can I support him in the work that he's doing? He's got important work to do. How I need to be able to help him. That's what the virtuous woman is doing. She's going to do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Verse 13, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. And I want to point out that word, willingly. First of all, we see that she's working with her hands. The virtuous woman is not idle. The virtuous woman is not just sitting on the couch eating bonbons watching the TV. And you're going to see this the more and more and more as we get through this chapter. There is no time for that. The virtuous woman is keeping busy. She seeks out the wool, she seeks out the flax, and she works willingly with her hands. Willingly means she doesn't have to, you know, her husband doesn't need to be on her saying, 
okay, I need to get this patch. We need to get clothing. You know, we need, we need some of this stuff. You need to be getting to work. I need you doing something for me here. But she's willingly able to do it, willingly taking on the tests, willingly taking these jobs. Now, are all women like this? No, but this is talking about the virtuous woman. This is what the virtuous woman does. Verse number 14, she is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. Now, why is that important? She bringeth her food from afar. I think there's a lot of value to that. One, when, when it's referring to the merchant's ships, right? You get it at a much more reduced cost. You cut out a lot of middlemen. She's finding the good deals. She's able to go out and, and really seek out the good places to get this. And I think this also will, can demonstrate that you're getting a variety as well. You're able to get other things. You're able to, you know, the virtuous woman's going out and... Um, just like the merchant ship, she bringeth her food from afar. Verse 15, she riseth also while it is yet night. And this is going to the point of how much work a virtuous woman does as a wife. Getting up, I mean, think about it. Getting up while it's still night, while it's still dark outside, rising up before everyone else wakes up. It says, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She's getting up before everyone else in order to start making breakfast, start making a meal. Getting things ready for the day. She's the first one up. She considereth a field and buyeth it. Verse 16. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. So we see her, what's she doing? Working with wool and flax. She's going out and bringing her food from afar. She's getting up before it's even, you know, dawn to make food. And then she's going out to the field and with the fruit of her own hand, she's planting a vineyard. Verse 17, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. Well, yeah, you got to be strong when you're doing all that stuff. This is a busy woman. She's got a lot of things going on. Does this sound like she has time to go out and get a job? To just get out to get some other job and work for some other boss and some other man? No, she's got a lot of things going on right now on her plate. And you know what? These are all things that help the household. But these are all godly, virtuous things for a woman to do. And, and, and you know, a woman having strength is not unfeminine. You can have strength and still be feminine. You have strength because you're a hard worker, because you do all these things, and still be feminine. You don't have to be a total weakling. Even though you're the weaker vessel, there's still um, a lot of work to be done. Look at verse 18. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. So not only is she getting up early before dawn, she says her candle's not going out by night. Working hard all the day through into the night. And, you know, you don't need a candle until after it gets dark outside. She says her candle's not going out by night. Getting up early, staying up late, and working all throughout the day. And this is, you know... I don't have them in my notes, but the Bible talks a lot about idleness and gossip and being busybodies and stuff like that. The virtuous woman has no time to get caught up in any of those things. The virtuous woman has no time for Facebook. Right. The virtuous woman has no time to just go dilly-dally and go out and be hanging out and, and doing whatever and getting into trouble and being idle and getting into sin because the virtuous woman is going to be working. And then working some more. And then working some more. Let's keep, let's keep reading on, the, on the, the, how much it works. Look at verse 19. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. Now we start to see a little bit of her heart, too. She's got a good heart. She cares about people. She's doing enough work to where she's able to still be able to stretch out her hand to the poor and to help people in need and, and to do things to help other people out. When you're working that much, and we're going to see this too as we continue on, not only is she able to help her own family as far as them being fed and them being clothed and, you know, and doing the sewing and doing all the things that are necessary for her own family, but she's working so hard that she's able to then help out other people in need. She's able to overproduce what's required just for the immediate family. 
And that's another godly thing to be able to do. She reaches forth her hands to the needy. Verse 21, She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. Basically, what it's teaching is that her family is taken care of. Okay, when, it, when it's coming close to wintertime, she's not scrambling and wondering, oh man, what are we going to do? It's starting to get cold outside. Oh, I need to put something together. She's already thought about that. She already has everything put together. She already has the clothes ready to go to keep her family warm throughout the wintertime. Verse number 22, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. A virtuous woman is going to find a husband that's going to appreciate the virtuous woman and that's going to be a leader, a strong leader, and someone who's doing something with his life too. And that's, you know, that's why it says her husband is known in the gates. He's someone who's known. You know, when you're a hardworking woman, when you're doing what's right, you're going you're gonna to be holding out and waiting for the man that's going to be a good man for you. And it's going to be known in the gates. It's going to be taken care of you. Someone who, who says he, he's, when he sitteth among the elders of the land, people respect his opinion. He's a hard worker too. The husband of the virtuous woman should be a hard worker also. Being able to provide for her to, to, to get all the supplies that she needs in order to do all this other work. Verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing. Notice nothing about broided hair and pearls and gold and silver and costly array. Her, her clothing are her words, her strength and her honor. She's respected. She has honor. The woman doing all these things is very respected. And she shall rejoice in time to come. Look at verse 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. So there's two things here, wisdom and kindness. The Bible does not teach, contrary to what so many people might want to tell you that it teaches, we don't believe that women should be dumb or stupid or that, you know, because, just because the Bible says that the women should learn in silence and if they're going to learn anything, ask their husband home, it doesn't mean that we don't want women to learn. That's just the way that they learn. That's just the way that it, that it, that it ought to happen. Women ought to have wisdom. You ought to be very smart. I mean, I'm teaching my daughters as much as I possibly can. I want them to be extremely smart. And I don't think there's any lack of women being able to have wisdom or knowledge. I don't think they're inferior to men when it comes to gaining wisdom or having knowledge. I don't think there's any difference there. They could be very wise. There's just a difference in your role. That's why we see here the things that the women are doing in this role for being a wife are different than the things that we would see a virtuous man doing because the virtuous man is going to be going off and working by the sweat of his brow and providing for the, you know, the, uh, financially for the means of his family as well as leading them and directing them. But here we see all the work and the strength and the honor that a woman receives through the work that she's doing. Now, she ought to have wisdom. If you're a virtuous woman, you should have wisdom. You should make it a priority for you to be reading God's word and memorizing and learning and getting God's word in your heart and asking your husband about things that you don't understand and getting wisdom from him. She opened her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is a law of kindness. The virtuous woman is kind to other people. And even though you have all these other things going on and you're extremely busy, you can still treat people kindly and still give to the needy and to the poor, right? You're not so busy that you have no time for anybody else for anything and you're going to be rude about it. In her tongue is the law of kindness. Look at verse 27. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. By the time we got here to verse number 27, I think it's pretty obvious she's not eating the bread of idleness. There's all these other things that are going on in the virtuous woman's life. But it's iterated here. It's, 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 it's you know, told she's not eating the bread of idleness. And women, you know, look at your own lives and ask yourself, am I being idle? Are there times where I'm just not doing anything? You ought to be able to change that. You should, you should, you should be busy. Keep yourself... Look, I, when you are idle, it's when you get into sin all the time. 
There are so many things you could be doing. Look at this whole list already that we've seen the virtuous woman doing that you could be doing to, to busy yourself and to keep yourself doing things. Any of these things are going to be good. And not all of these things are like, you know, wisdom is mentioned there. So yeah, you could be reading the Bible and doing this and that, but that doesn't have to, to consume your entire day, especially if you're a woman that doesn't have a lot. You, know, you don't have a big family. You don't have a lot of other things that might be taking your attention like it is in my family. I mean, my family, my wife's busy all the time just from the sheer fact that we have so many little ones and all messes being made and things, you know, every time you turn around, there's something that needs to be done. So, I mean, it's just, it's just constant. But not everyone's in that same situation. So, you could think, well, I already read my Bible and I already pray and praise God for that. Hopefully, you're, do, you know, you're doing those things. You're doing these types of things. They're great. But take up some other work for yourself to do. Try to take up some form of gardening. Try to take up some sewing. Try to take up some of these things, you know, searching out the great deals, being like the, the, you know, the merchant ships that bring their food from afar. Try as much as you can all of these various things. Make it applicable to your situation to keep yourself busy and keep yourself busy in, in, in doing something that's good. Maybe even, you know, here's a crazy thought. Ask your husband what he thinks what he thinks you should be spending your time with and doing, what you can do to help him out in his life and in his schedule and what he wants to get accomplished. Ask him those things. Maybe you've never even asked him that before. Think about that. But you don't want to eat the bread of idleness. You're, you're going to get into trouble every time and it's only going to, going, to, going to hurt you in the long run. Look at verse number 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. You will get the praise, you will get the blessings, you will get the, the respect due to you when you live an honorable life and you're raising your children right, you're providing for everybody, you're doing all this work. Everyone's going to see that. Your whole family is going to recognize that and pay attention and notice that. It's not going to go unnoticed when you are doing so virtuously as this woman does here. And that is a good feeling, by the way, to have people just, just blessing you and praising you for all the good things that you're doing. That's, that will bring you joy also. Verse number 29, many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful. And it closes out with this. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. Too many women these days spend their time on things that are vain, things that are meaningless, things that don't really matter. Things that don't really matter that that Outward physical appearance. Spending an hour in front of the mirror. Getting all the hairs just right. Getting all the makeup put on. Getting all the jewels. Getting all the, the you know, getting everything in its place before you could step out the door. It's vain. It's vanity. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. That's the praise you want. The praise for your good works. The, the adorning of the good things that you do. That's the type of praise that's going to be meaningful. You may get a, a, a form of praise. Because this is what happens. When women go out and, and they start becoming more and more immodest, you get attention from guys. You will get some kind of, oh, you know, the, the whistles, <laughs> You know, going down the street, the construction workers, you know, making comments. You could get attention. And in a way, you might want to call that praise. But I'll tell you right now, that's not the type of praise that you want to be getting. And it's definitely not from the people you want to be getting it from. Those are not the guys that are sitting with the elders that are known in the gates. Okay, those are not the guys for the virtuous woman. And that is all meaningless anyways. And all they're doing is commenting on your flesh and the, the, the lusts of their own heart coming out as they lust after you. And that's a, I'll tell you that right now, it's a sin to be provocative and trying to provoke men into lusting after you with their eyes. It's going to be a false sense of joy by, by getting that type of attention from guys. And, and don't be deceived by it. Don't think that you need to get that type of attention. If you're struggling to get attention, don't get it that way. 
There's way, way better ways to get attention than in your outward appearance. Get the attention through the good works that you do, through the, through the virtue that you have, and, and through the fact that you fear the Lord. Verse number 31, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Lots of teaching on the virtue. This is a great, 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 great chapter to memorize, um, especially for the ladies. If you want to try to live a more godly life, a more virtuous life, and you want to not have as much idle time, study this chapter out, study it out, read it over and over again, and, and let it sink down. We see what the Bible teaches as far as, as tonight we look mostly at women's roles, but it's very old-fashioned. Very old-fashioned. But it's God's Word. And you have, everyone, you have to make that decision for yourself. Are you going to try to be pleasing in the sight of God? Do you like, would you like for God to look down and say, I really value her. I really appreciate what she's doing. Or do you care more about what the world thinks and, and what they're going to say about you? Hopefully you care about what God thinks. I mean, that's why we're here tonight. That's why we're preaching. That's why we're going through the book of Proverbs. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the wisdom that we've read through these past 31 weeks. God, I pray that you would please help us to continually increase in our knowledge and in our wisdom, dear Lord, and that you would teach us daily because we're reading from your words every day. Dear God, I pray that you please help us to be bold to make the stand of making the changes necessary in our lives to do what's right by you, to not worry about ridicule or criticism from this unbelieving world or even by other people who, who are Christians or claim to be Christians, dear Lord, that don't have the respect for your word that we do. Lord, I pray that you please help us to, to do what's right. And um, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.